Thank you very much for that. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Frances Crook, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Howard Lee for Penal Reform based in London. This session is on the impact of problem gambling um, on patterns of crime and societal harms um, and innovative responses. I'm just going to say a few words to introduce the, the session, and then I'm going to introduce um, our speaker, um, Andrew Nielsen. And uh, we want to hear from you. We want to hear what's what's um, going on in other countries. That's the, the purpose of this session, is to share information and to share ideas. Uh, I just want to say a, a few words about how the European reform. Uh, we're a, um, a UK-based um, NGO, uh, founded over 150 years ago, and uh, we work for um, less crime, safer communities, and fewer people in prison. Um, we do research, we run campaigns for change, for penal reform, and we have a legal team which represents children and young adults in custody, supporting them and taking legal cases to achieve change, both individual change and uh, systemic change. We are independent of government, we are independently funded, and we, are, we guard that independence very fiercely. Um, we are very proud to be part of the, uh, this, this uh, event, the, the Crime Congress. We have been represented at Crime Congresses for many, many years and have held ancillary events. And in fact, we were one of the very first NGOs to gain consultative status in 1947. So we've been working with the UN um, as an NGO for decades. Now, as I said, the purpose of this session is to share information we, um, Andrew Nielsen will explain what, why we're concerned and what the work that we're doing, but we're particularly interested in hearing from other people what's going on around the world. Um, so I want to introduce Andrew Nielsen, who is the Howard League's Director of Campaigns. He's also a member of the, the commission, um, which we've set up to look at the problem, at the issue of crime and problem gambling. And he's going to explain what the commission is doing um, our concerns and um, what, uh, what the issue is. Andrew, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. So, uh, good afternoon. It is estimated around 2 million adults in the United Kingdom experience some level of harm from problem gambling. Almost one in five of those adults will have gambling disorder. Gambling disorder is a recognized mental health condition and the World Health Organization defines it as an addictive behavior with implications for mental health. One academic study of an English male prison found that problem gambling was reported among 27.8% of the prisoners sampled. One Australian survey reported that 11% of pathological gamblers reported engaging in gambling related illegal activity. Today I'm going to um, talk about this issue of problem gambling and how it relates to crime. This is an overview of what I will cover. So to begin with, just to recap on, on what Francis said about the, the Howard League for Penal Reform, our jurisdiction of concern is England and Wales within the United Kingdom. We were founded in 1866 and the statue in this slide is that of John Howard, for whom we are named after. Howard is commonly considered the first prison reformer. Today we campaign for less crime, safer communities, fewer people in prison. We are an independent NGO receiving no direct government funding and we have both UN and Council of Europe consultative status. And as Francis explained, we take um, varied approaches to achieving the change we want to see. We campaign for changes in policy and practice using public affairs and the media. We're also a legal practice representing children and young people in custody under the age of 21 and we are a research hub uh, with an advisory group of academics, a biannual international conference and an academic journal 
the Howard Journal of Crime and Justice. One of our special interests is in breaking new ground and looking at issues in criminal justice which are being ignored. On this slide, I give three examples of topics where we've launched inquiries or programmes of work to shed light and raise the profile of issues among policymakers. So, for example, a decade ago, we launched an inquiry into former armed service personnel in prison. In 2013, we ran a commission which investigated the topic of sex in prison at a time when government ministers insisted that sex was not happening in their prisons. And more recently, we have been conducting a programme of work to end the criminalisation of children living in residential care. So our latest project in, in that strand of, of work looking to break new ground uh, is the Commission on Crime and Problem Gambling. And I want to begin by summarising what one person has told us about their own experience of problem gambling and crime. So to quote, I am 54 years old. The occasional and social bet for over two decades turned into an all-consuming addiction from literally the moment I placed my first online bet. Over a period of seven years, I gambled away all of my savings, reached limits on numerous credit cards, and took out numerous loans and payday loans to fund my gambling. Sadly, I started to steal from my workplace to feed my addiction. Over a period of four years, I stole around £192,000 until I could no longer carry on what I was doing and confess to my crime. I received a custodial sentence of 27 months. In this particular gentleman's case, it later transpired that a gambling operator had repaid some of the money he stole and paid the gambling regulator £1 million for failings in their responsibilities to identify him as a problem gambler when dealing with him as a customer. Not only does that raise interesting questions as to culpability, whose fault was this, uh, but this gentleman's experience of the criminal justice system was purely one of punishment, the custodial sentence he received for the crimes he committed while suffering from gambling disorder. There were no interventions offered to help him whilst in prison, and no opportunities taken at earlier points in his journey through the criminal justice system to divert or signpost him to relevant services in the community. Gambling disorder does not merit the same sort of consideration that alcohol or substance misuse might bring. This despite the fact it is now a recognised mental health condition, as I said at the beginning of my remarks. How did the Howard League become aware of problem gambling and its links to crime? We run annual awards for organisations that work to keep people out of the criminal justice system. In 2017, Cheshire Police and a charity called the Beacon Counselling Trust won one of our awards for developing a diversion pathway for problem gamblers who came to the attention of local police officers. Discussions in Cheshire made it clear to us there was very little being done elsewhere in the country on this issue. The Howard League decided to remedy this and begin our own investigations. We established the Commission on Crime and Problem Gambling in June 2019. It is chaired by Lord Goldsmith QC, as pictured on the slide. He leads a commission of 16 individuals, comprising of academics, and professionals with expertise in criminal justice, public health, the gambling industry, and with lived experience of gambling addiction. The Commission is running for three years and seeks to answer three questions. What are the links between problem gambling and crime? What impact do these links have on communities and society? And what should be done? So let me provide a brief overview of what the Commission has been doing. Key to our work is gathering evidence. The Commission has been holding a series of oral evidence sessions and has already begun making policy submissions to government. Visits to foreign jurisdictions were planned but are on hold um, due to the pandemic. Similarly, an international conference at the University of Oxford 
postponed from 2020, will now take place in the autumn of 2022. The Commission has also published a literature review in order to identify gaps in academic research. The literature review was comprehensive, but it did primarily reveal a lack of knowledge worldwide. Jurisdictions we looked at included Australasia, the United States of America, Canada, Germany, Scandinavia, and the United Kingdom. While there was limited published research across these jurisdictions, there was a consistency in the findings that has provided helpful pointers for the Commission's work. Firstly, there was a high prevalence of crimes being committed to fund gambling. Unfortunately, we have no hard and fast figures to assess the seriousness of problem gambling when it comes to offending. Most of the detailed research on the prevalence of crime among gamblers has taken place with two communities, gamblers who are presented for treatment and within incarcerated populations. This skews the research. There is likely to be a significant amount of unreported and undetected crime by problem gamblers. It may also be the case that crimes remain unreported because affected family, friends or even employers may not want to report the offence. Secondly, there was some interesting findings relating to the types of crime. We see not just white collar crime, such as fraud, which tends to be the focus of the limited media coverage on problem gambling and crime, but also offences in public spaces, such as street robbery. People in the depths of gambling disorder may not even understand that what they are doing is a crime. Where money is stolen from employers or family members, those committing the crime often see themselves as borrowing the money with the hope of paying it back from future gambling wins. Finally, we saw other related harms. There is concerning evidence of domestic abuse and child neglect linked to problem gambling behaviours. So the Commission is now exploring how to build our knowledge. What exactly is the prevalence of gambling-related gambling crime in the UK? What is the nature of links between gambling and crime? What are the characteristics of problem gamblers who commit crime? And what do the answers to these questions mean for policy and practice? In order to answer these questions, we have launched a number of small research projects. The first project is surveying and interviewing sentencers to explore their understanding and treatment of the problem gamblers who come before them in the courts. That research should be published in the next month or so. Our second project is exploring people's lived experience of crime and problem gambling. And further research is forthcoming and will start to fill those gaps in knowledge that the Commission's Literature Review has uncovered. So why are we here today? We are here today at the 14th United Nations Congress on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice to hear from all of you. Is problem gambling an issue in your nation? Are people coming before the police and the courts who may have offended because of their gambling disorder? Is this a hidden harm that criminal justice professionals in your jurisdiction are not aware of? Could our understanding of crime and problem gambling, so limited as it currently is, point to the tip of an iceberg? The Howard League hopes that our commission will have lessons for countries around the world. But right now we are at the start of the conversation and we hope to start it. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, very comprehensive overview of, of uh, what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, and really the, the point of this session is to hear from other people. Um, and to ask the question, what is going on in other countries? As, we, as Andrew pointed out, we did carry out a literature, we commissioned a, a literature review, which showed some research in some jurisdictions, um, and that people were started to be aware that it's a growing problem, but um, there seems to be very little work going on. And we deliberately held this session without a lot of speakers. I know quite a lot of sessions do have speaker after speaker after speaker, but we deliberately didn't do that because what we wanted to do was, was to consult. This session is a consultative exercise um, to, to, as a, to scan the landscape 
and see if there is any work going on in other jurisdictions. And to be quite honest, what our literature review found was that there's very little work going on around the world, and yet it is a growing problem. Um, individuals are getting caught up in the criminal justice system. There is a lot of problem gambling, a lot of gambling addiction, and um, it will become an increasing problem across the world. Um, and we appear to be the only people um, examining it at the moment. So I predict that the next um, UN Congress will have more sessions on problem and gambling and crime. Um, it's just that we're an early um, an early in the in the debate. A pioneer. Yes, I think the only um, the only study that we were aware of um, before our our project was in Australia in the state of Victoria, where they did do um, some research on this. Um, but generally, there 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 is very little work being done um, on the links between problem gambling and crime. Um, and yet it does seem, particularly obviously in the UK, um, but I think in many other jurisdictions, um, it is an increasing um, issue, uh, which the criminal justice system just isn't, isn't across and isn't really understanding. And as I said in, in the presentation, um, the sort of, um, even just asking the question that you might expect from um, someone with um, drug problems, alcohol problems, you know, that the police would um, ask that question. Do you have those issues when you're in the police station? Um, at, or at any point in the criminal justice system, professionals might ask whether um, those are issues which have contributed to your offending. That That isn't happening when it comes to problem gambling. Um, and so the onus is really on the individual um, to admit uh, the problem. Um, and even then, uh, it's very unlikely that they will get any help um, from criminal justice professionals. With some of the cases that we've found, the individuals have reported um, how devastating their addiction and their problem gambling has been for families. Um, it can be absolutely catastrophic for families because, and it can become very, um, very bad very, very quickly because there's no limit to the kind of gambling that people can, can indulge in very, very quickly. So people can lose their homes, families can lose their homes, they can get into massive debt. Um, it's a very high, it can be a very high value crime, um, very, very quickly. Um, and yet, as, as Andrew said, there's very little understanding of it within the criminal justice system. The research we're about to publish, that we conducted with our magistrates, um, who uh, there are some about 13,000 lay magistrates in, in England and Wales, and they are there's the first court, the, the first court that hears um, crimes um, and remands people. And we, we consulted um, something like six or 700 magistrates to ask them about their knowledge. And it was really quite startling how little understanding there is in, in the people who do the sentencing. In our, in our court system, so it's a it's a it's a growing problem, uh, which is very little understood, and and yet is devastating lives, um, and on scale. Yeah, I think one of the other interesting findings from the literature review, which I didn't mention in the presentation, um, is around women women and gambling related crimes. So the the prevalence of problem gambling among women in the criminal justice system is quite striking from the limited information that we've got. It would seem that women who are arrested are as likely to have gambling problems as men. Um, there was one um, study um, which actually found that in the sample of people arrested, 47.6% of women in their sample um, were classified as problem gamblers compared to 31.6% of men. And if that has a read across in terms of crime, that's quite unusual. Obviously, women tend not to commit crime in the way that men do. Um, but when it comes to problem gambling related crime, that may not be the same case. Um, we are, of course, looking at different kinds of gambling, um, whether it's buying, getting addicted to buying lottery tickets, 
whether it's um, online gambling, whether it's um, racing or uh, work in, in betting shops, um, any, any kind of gambling at all. And we, we will be looking also at the link between gaming and gambling, which is um, a slippery slope in some ways. Uh, so it's, it's, it's every aspect of the individual's engagement with, with problem gambling and um, the, the consequent um, committing crimes to feed the habit um, because it gets out of control. It's probably worth also saying that in the UK, um, what we we have experienced is over a decade and a half of um, liberalisation of gambling laws. Um, and that has fueled, um, a, you know, a huge amount of the gambling um, and the problem gambling that we see in, in our jurisdiction. Um, and it is a big issue in, in, in the UK in terms of media coverage and political um, salient, saliency. Um, gambling and concern around problem gambling is, is really a, a hot topic, we might say. The government is currently uh, undertaking a review of gambling legislation um, with, I think, an intent to, um, to um, reverse some of the liberalisation that we saw. Um, and so the, there is a, that specific context for us that um, over that decade and a half um, of liberalising the gambling legislation, uh, that is almost certainly fueled not just um, problem gambling, but then the crime related to problem gambling. Um, but the UK's example is not atypical. There are lots of jurisdictions with liberal gambling um, laws, uh, and we suspect um, that other jurisdictions will have the same um, issues with crime and problem gambling that we have in the UK. Right. Um, is there anyone who wants to participate, who wants to ask a question, put something in the chat or say, say yeah. something? So, from the venue, um, so at this point, I have one question uh, regarding the, um, the data saying that women are more likely to engage in gambling. So uh, I'm curious, like about like how is the data collected? Please. I think what Andrew was saying, although Andrew, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that um, men tend to be men tend to commit more crimes than women, um, and men engage uh, get. Uh, in conflict generally with the criminal justice system than women. But what we're finding is that women are committing crimes linked to gambling on a bigger scale than, um, than in any other area. Andrew, do you want to just say something about that? You probably explain it better than me. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I mean, in terms of how we, the, the studies that have taken place, they are very small um, and um, they are, as I said in the presentation, limited to people who have um, presented themselves for treatment or studies of incarcerated populations. So researchers going into prisons and asking questions. Um, and and the concern really, is, as, as I said in the presentation, is, is what it does skew the findings in that um, most problem gambling and crime um, is not going to be uh, done by people in prison or indeed um, um, by the people who have got to the point where they're presenting themselves um, as, as being a problem gambler and needing help. Um, so there is, there is pretty limited um, research um, into this um, there was, um, I know there was a, um, a study in 2003 in Australia, which went into, looked into um, correction facilities uh, there. The study that I mentioned at the beginning of our presentation um, into a male prison in England uh, took place in 2012. There was also, that also um, uh, did look at um, a female prison. So I said there was a 27.8% prevalence uh, reported amongst the sample in in, in, in in the, the male prison, it was 18.1% amongst the female sample. Um, but other researchers I've mentioned 
uh, suggests that it's it's more um, it's more even the the prevalence for men and women. Um, I think the issue really is that, um, as we know, um, women tend not to commit um, violent or sexual offences. They sometimes do, but it's it's rarer. Um, uh, that tends to be the sort of offence that we associate with men. The issue with problem gambling, of course, is that it's financial. You know, if if you do end up offending, um, it will often be financially motivated, and it is to do with the fact that you have got yourself into uh, a lot of debt. Um, and perhaps that is one of the reasons why we see um, women being, if not as likely, pretty you know pretty much as likely as men to commit crime. Uh, due to problem gambling, because it's not violent or sexual offence. It's 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 to do with it's very much to do with the problem gambling. And in a sense, your gender is irrelevant. Um, in, in, in if you're in trouble, you're in trouble. The kind of crimes we're, we're talking about um, are, so sort of, I suppose, they fall into two different categories primarily. And uh, one is the the, the fraud. Uh, which we're finding women are getting involved in. So a woman will get um, addicted to, to, to gambling. She uh, will then start uh, committing fraud in order to feed her habit. Um, that can be for her family, so she can take out lots of credit cards. She can um, pretend to be another member of her family. To She can use her mortgage. Um, it's, it's, it's often with the family, sometimes with an employer. So um, fraud, and if she has access to money in her employer, that could be a fraud. The, the second kind of crime is is more uh, is more linked to violence. Um, so we're finding it uh, um, problem gambling um, is linked to domestic abuse and domestic violence. That tends to be uh, more men committing that, probably, but, but more, um, and it can also be. Um, problematic were and linked to um, alcohol, um, drugs, and other um, other problem behaviours. Um, so it's it's across the board, and it's it's often it's sometimes one thing that leads to crime, but it's sometimes also a comorbidity. Um, it's um, linked to other behaviours which are also risky, antisocial, or even criminal. Does that answer your question? <laughs> um, uh, yes, um, but I'm still curious that this is just for the um, UK or is it universal, like universally accepted um, information? Andrew. So the this is the problem. We, you know, as I say, that most jurisdictions have not done um, research into this. Um, we know that um, there has been some work done in Australia um, and some work done in the United States, um, but most jurisdictions um, have, yeah, are not asking the question. So, and I think that's really key to, to what, what our work is about and in, in more ways than one. So, um, the Commission itself is asking the questions that I talked about in our presentation around uh, the links and trying to understand uh, what precisely is going on um, between uh, problem gambling and crime. Um, but if anything, what we're, what we're hoping comes out of this is that, 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 que that those questions are asked um, by more researchers um, across the world in different jurisdictions, we see academic studies into this, um, and ultimately, if that if the evidence can be provided uh, that this is a significant issue, that that problem gambling is a an engine to crime in the same way that um, substance misuse is, poor mental health, or or, al or, or alcohol problems, um, then there should be questions asked um, within the criminal justice system, and there should be um, uh, possibilities, for example, um, if a police officer comes, um, someone comes to the attention of the police, uh, and the question is asked, you know, is is your offending due to problem gambling, and that person says yes, 
then the police should have the opportunity to potentially signpost that person to counselling services or whatever um, might be required to help them with their problem gambling. Um, and at the moment, other than the one project that we uh, gave an award to in the UK, that's not happening. And that could be replicated at every stage of the system. So um, it could be something that the probation officer um, is similarly asking about and can similarly signpost um, someone to services. Um, it's something that could be asked in court. Um, ultimately, if it gets to it um, and someone is in prison and, and it's only then that it becomes apparent that their problem gambling is an issue. And we haven't talked about gambling in prison, which is also an interesting topic, that uh, there is quite a lot of gambling that happens actually in prisons. Um, but again, that there should be the opportunity to um, put people in touch with services that can help them. Um, and at the moment, that's not happening. I think it's interesting that the um, thank you, Andrew, for that. that was wonderful. Um, I think it's interesting that the um, having been at crime congresses over the years, uh, there's been a lot of work on an understanding worldwide about the links between you know, about drugs, for example. Um, but this has not been an issue that the, um, the, the the world has come to terms with the, the issue about gambling. Now, what we are not doing is that our commission um, is not going to look at serious and organised crime linked to gambling. But, of course, that is a very big issue worldwide, but we simply can't deal with it. And I think that the um, that ought to be something that, that other bodies look at. What we're looking at is the individual um, and how they fit into the pattern, what kind of crimes individuals commit. and. To a certain extent, how they become victims of corporate greed um, and uh, the, the pressure and the unregulated um, access to gambling, uh, which, as Andrew said, is, is advertised very widely everywhere um, in the UK. You can't get away from it. We are bombarded with the, um, advertising pressure to gamble and it's become increasingly an issue with people becoming addicted and therefore committing crimes in order to feed that habit. Um, there's some very complicated questions. The other thing that we would like to look at, um, which I think is, is follows on from your question, um, is the way that different, um, different populations gamble in different ways. Um, we, we, think, we know that women gamble in a different way to men. Uh, they, they use gambling in a different way and they commit different sorts of crimes. Um, but we also know that different minorities or different populations commit um, different sorts of crimes linked to um, different patterns of, of um, in, in addicted to gambling and different sorts of gambling. There's a lot of research to be done and we're right at the beginning. Um, I think the world is right at the beginning of understanding this as a problem which is going to get a lot worse. And unless we pay attention to it now, uh, at the next Crime Congress, and the one after that, and the one after that, this will become an increasing problem uh, that people will start to pay attention to. So I'm, I'm, I'm asking people to, to, to do it now before too many lives are wrecked, um, which is what we're seeing in, in, um, in England and Wales. Um, families and lives being being wrecked. And indeed, people have taken their own lives, young people, their own lives by suicide because of the um, extreme distress and the problems it has caused them. So it's a very, very serious problem, um, but very little understanding of it. I think one of the, one of the challenges for us has been, as I, I said, that we were intending to make... Um, fact-finding trips to other jurisdictions, and that has been curtailed by the pandemic. Um, I think we would have gone to Australia because I mentioned that they had, uh, in the state of Victoria, they have done some um, research um, on this issue, um, and we were interested to find out more about that. Um, in America, the interestingly and my understanding is these have actually been discontinued they're, they're not they're no they're no longer in operation um but in the states of nevada and new york um around 
um, around the turn of the millennium, um, they did set up gambling courts, so specialist courts to deal with with um, crime related to problem gambling. And I think that that um, uh, comes from um, something else that we've seen in, in the United States, which is uh, specialist drug treatment courts. Um, now, those gambling courts, as I say, um, unfortunately, they, they, as far as I'm aware, they, they, they're no longer operating and there was very limited evaluation of what they were doing at the time. Um, but that's exactly the sort of thing that, that you know, if, if it was felt, and it's interesting that one of the states was Nevada, um, and we think about Las Vegas, probably the, 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 the city most synonymous with gambling, but it was felt that, uh, there that, that it was such an issue that they should actually have specialist courts to deal with cases. Um, I'm sure there is quite a lot that we could we could find out um, um, from people who were involved in those projects. Um, perhaps we might not want to follow them. I'm not sure we need specialist courts as such, certainly in the UK. Um, but it, as I say, interesting that an interesting sign of another jurisdiction where this has been um, uh, recognised as, 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 as a significant issue. Thank you for your question. Is there anything else you'd like to ask or is there any follow-up you'd like? Oh, if, if no one asked a question, I... If me uh, if I could some make some question, is it all right? Yes, please. Oh, like yeah, as the previous, you know, participant asked the you know university. Yeah, I had a same impression because you mentioned about only you know common law jurisdiction. So yeah, I wonder yeah if there's any you know common things between common jurisdiction and also con you know, other jurisdiction like Japan is not common jurisdiction, but because you know, ah, uh, like two thousand, like yeah, in few years ahead, the government tried to invite like integrate and the like casino result for their you know for Japan. So someone you know asking about you know what is the impact of those kind of casino or something like those gambling thing to Japanese society. So that's why I was, you know, I wonder, you know, is there any, uh, maybe you, yeah, according to you, what you present, I think you didn't, you know, your, your focus is not on the Japan, but like we are in Kyoto. So I just, you know, want to know if, is there any information about that? So I want to know. The answer to your question is, I don't know. Nobody knows. I don't think that there's been any research. As far as I'm aware, the uh, the research that we did, the, the literature search that we did, didn't show up anything particular from Japan. Um, as Andrew pointed out, there's there's work been done in Australia um, and in certain parts of America. Um, that's where the primary sort of awareness is. I would be amazed if it's not a problem in every country in the world. But it's an emerging problem. And particularly as gambling becomes international with um, on the internet, this is a new issue for the internet. Um, it's so easy to gamble on the internet and it's very difficult for jurisdictions to control it. So a nation state, it's quite hard for that nation state to control it. Um, so it will be a problem in Japan, and there will be individuals who are um, who are addicted to gambling and who are committing crimes as a result. And I think that will be true in every country. The issue is that not everyone is aware of it yet, um, but they will be. It will be a big issue, and I, as I say, I predict that the next Congress it will be a much bigger issue. Um, and I think it's something that the, the UN, it's the, the, um, the UN itself ought to look at. Um, so the answer to about Japan is we don't know. And I don't think anybody in Japan knows. And there needs to be research done to find out. And until people start coming to court 
um, with crimes that, that look as though they're about something else, but actually underneath the, it's the crime addiction. So they will come to court committing crimes to do with domestic abuse, domestic violence, fraud, theft. Um, but actually underneath it is, is the addiction. Um, there'll be recognition in Japan that if people are committing those crimes because they have an addiction to drugs or to alcohol or they have mental health problems, but the question is not being asked about gambling. And it's not being asked anywhere. You should add as well that there are um, there are um, shared problems that um, you might see, or what what, the, what in academic language, um, in psychiatric language is called comorbidities, um, that you might see if someone has problem gambling, um, if someone has, sorry, pathological gambling or gambling disorder, uh, then there is a high chance that they also have an alcohol problem um, or a drug problem. Um, they almost certainly um, will have a mental health issue. Um, those things go hand in hand. So it's possible that um, people are um, coming to the attention of the criminal justice system for the, um, and those other issues are being recognised, but they still are not understanding that problem gambling is part of that picture. And, and it may actually be um, the thing which is really behind the criminal activity. Because, it's, because, as I say, there is often um, a very direct link between um, financial crimes being committed um, due to um, the problem gambling. But there may be all sorts of other issues there as well. Indeed. Um, we should probably... is there... Yes, go on. Sorry, Francis, I was saying we should probably say, particularly as this um, is being recorded and people might watch it after the live mm -hmm. session, we should probably say that if anyone um, does want to get in touch with us, um, then please do. Um, our email address is info, I-N-F-O, at howardleague.org. Um, and if you title the email um, Crime and Problem Gambling, um, then that will definitely um, come to our attention uh, and we will, we will be happy to um, respond to any questions at a later date. And there is a lot of information about what we're doing and the literature uh, review is the literature is, is published on our website. So if you look on the Howard League the Penal Reform website, there's a lot of information and we are publishing all the research on, on the website. So if anyone is um, interested, please visit the website and have a look at everything that's published, including information about the commission itself um, and what we're doing. I'm just typing the um, email address, sorry, the, uh, both the, the web address uh, in the chat box. And now the email address so people can see that. There we go. Right. Thank you. Okay, well I do hope that there will be um more conversations about this and that people will look at our website and contact us if they've got any information. We will continue to be working over the next year or so. We will be publishing research. Um, we have several research projects um coming up to be published in the next over the next year or so. Um, which we hope will be useful to all jurisdictions because the problems are are international. And uh, we will be probably at the next Congress with another session. Um, is there anything else? Oh, if may I? Um, so we are in the middle of COVID crisis, right? So is there any impact from COVID on the, you know, those kind of impact of, uh, of program of coming? Yeah. Very good question. I mean, we, we, we certainly worried about um, 
what people might be doing in in lockdown situations where they are stuck in their homes um and one of the few things they can do is go on the internet and gamble um obviously it's far too soon to tell whether that is a real issue and whether that in turn will lead to more crime um but it would certainly be a concern of ours um that um I mean, I mean, again, you know, I mentioned that you, it, there are shared problems. One of the problems that you might well have if you're a problem gambler is anxiety disorder. Well, there's a lot to be anxious about at the moment with COVID. Um, and, and yes, you, if you're at home and you, one of the few outlets that you have is to go online um, and you potentially are enticed into um, gambling, then um, that could be a serious issue and and. and, and it comes back to what Francis was saying, that we suspect this is going to be um, a problem that we hear more and more about in coming years. And it is quite possible that that, that COVID um, will play a part in amplifying um, the issue of problem gambling and in turn then uh, the issue of crime that is uh, related to problem gambling. Absolutely, yeah. And of course, we don't know. But there'll have to be research on a, um, over the next few years to find out um, whether it has deepened the crisis. Anything else? More questions? Um, so, question from me. Is it okay? Yes. Yeah, please. So. Like a social media issue that's like worldwide. Do you think that is there any like nexus between like gambling and transnational crime? Because uh, I think uh, your research mainly in the uh, UK and then Australia, those problem affects to the other countries. It, it's not something we're looking at. We can't. Um, the Howard Lee for Penal Reform is a, um, a, a medium-sized NGO um, based in, in, in England and Wales, and we're, we're, we're simply not competent to look at transnational crime. And the answer to your question is undoubtedly yes. Uh, we know that um, trans you know, that that. I'm not going to name any of the various different organisations, but it's well known that um, gambling, um, bootlegging and, and all sorts of other things is, is um, serious and organised crime is very closely linked to gambling um, and, to, and it is transnational. And at the moment, because it's so easy to be transnational because of the internet, it will probably be um, a, a burgeoning issue. It is not something that we are looking at though. But I think it, it is a very serious problem and does need to be looked at by bodies that are more competent to do it than, than we are. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, may I ask questions? Of course. Oh, okay. So I'm not sure if um, this... Um, is a good question, but I've been thinking about it and want to know your All opinion. All questions are good. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I think we can't deny that the governmental elites and influential businessmen are heavily engaged in this kind of um, um, gambling. If without the these people who have um, power over the, their own jurisdiction, the gambling won't be supported. And do you think um, we have some? We have to uh, to do something with those people. And second question is that: Do you think there is a need for international treaty to tackle with the crimes related to uh, gambling? Thank you. I think the question of an international treaty is very interesting, um, and it's not something we've we've considered. Um, I certainly think that international. Uh, there need to be an international response um, and an international understanding. I don't know whether there's a um, what kind of um, an, what an international treaty would look like, uh, but I certainly think that that some leadership is needed internationally um, to deal with the two 
aspects to it. One is the individual in conflict with the criminal justice system because of their gambling. And the other is the serious organised and transnational crime. Um, so I think that that does need to be considered. Um, it's not something that our commission is looking at, but it's a very it's a it's a good point. I, I didn't quite understand your first question, the first part of your question. Could you just explain a bit more? Um, because uh, like the um, um, the question before me about like the re Japanese government building the casino resort. Um, ah, yes. Yes. So even in my country, Thailand, um, without the government, those business will never be supported that much. And be I think that's um, one of the factors that normalize the gambling culture in the country. So that's why I'm, I'm curious whether if we can do something with the the, the government or the those influential people who have something to do with the gambling business. I'm not sure if that's I think clear that, to you. Yes, yeah. that's it really interesting. The, um, I mean, governments make a lot of money from gambling. They get a lot of revenue from gambling. So there's a, an incentive to promote it because it's tax. It's legal. So they make a, you know, a lot of governments like to promote gambling, and that's why that in, in the UK, um, and I know in other countries as well, there's been a very liberal regime. Um, you know, you can do what you like. And it's only when they start to realise that there are adverse consequences to that. Um, a, a, casinos is one aspect, um, but they tend to be quite controlled. What we had was um, betting shops with machines in them where there was no limit. And you could, you could play on these machines in a betting shop and lose thousands and thousands of pounds incredibly quickly. Um, and the, of course, the government gets a lot of money from the tax revenue for that. But it was only when there was a big fuss about it um, that people were being drawn into problem gambling and losing a lot of money that the, the, um, there was a limit put on the, um, the betting machines. Um, so the pressure from government is to expand gambling because they make they can get tax revenue, whether it's casinos or machines or um, the sorts of betting. Um, the the sort of wild west of gambling, the the gambling that is uncontrolled or less controlled is on the internet, um, and governments are finding that very difficult to control. And of course, they don't get the, um, the revenue because quite often the companies are based not in, in the jurisdiction itself, but somewhere else um, offshore. Um, and it's very difficult to control um, and difficult to get the taxation from that. Um, but governments are pulled in different directions on this because of the income they get from the, from the taxation. So, so yep, yeah, it's. Um, going to be a difficult one. Andrew, do you want to add anything? Well, I, I, I just agree um, with um, the speaker's point about um, it, it is um, important for political leaders to show leadership. Yeah. And um, they can do that in a number of ways. And one of the, 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 the simplest ways is in their own behaviour. Um, uh, so of course, um, I would agree with with that with, with with what the question was basically getting at. Yes. Government leadership. Anything else? More questions or any points anyone wants to make? Um, or I think if we come to an end, we come to an end. Yeah. I think we've covered quite a lot of ground. Um, there's been some really interesting questions. Thank you for that. Uh, this session is, is being recorded and I think it's being, going to be made available fairly quickly. We'll put it on our website and um, hopefully they, the conversation will continue and people will, will get in contact with the Howard League, look at our website. Um, and I'm sure uh, when we publish our research, if, if people can uh, keep an eye out for that, um, because it's the, it is groundbreaking. It's, um, it's the, the first of its kind, 
and other jurisdictions apart from from the UK and England and Wales will will start to understand what's going on in their countries as well because it's it will be similar. Obviously, there'll be different cultural national historical differences but but the the issue is international um, and is growing um, and will become a, a serious problem for criminal justice systems criminal justice agencies around the world um i want to say thank you thank you for your questions thank you um aki and anna for helping us and for facilitating this session um, we we appreciate the the help we've had um, from um, the, the the UN and, and all the staff and everybody and Gary at the, um, um, in Japan um, and um, we um, will be engaging with you again in the future but thank you very much for your support thank you for your participation and uh, more work to be done thank you thank you <laughs>